some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, hello and welcome back to the channel, everybody. You know, we got an update on Chile today, so let's just go ahead and get into it. Now, apparently the reason for the, uh, well, communication blackout was that apparently Chile was actually in the hole this time. Not this BS that he keeps on talking about, but he was actually in the hole, apparently. But we'll let Chile explain that rationale, and apparently he thinks he's going to be getting out in July as well. But we will also listen to a real lawyer, and uh, that lawyer will explain why that isn't going to happen. So let's go ahead and sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hello world, today is May 10th, 2024. If you haven't been following my case, there's plenty of audio and video for you to catch up on. I was put in jail for obstruction, a charge that nobody gets put in jail on. But... You, you know, Chili, I would be careful with the blanket statements right there. For instance, saying that nobody gets uh, put in jail for obstruction. I've known a couple people in my time that have been put in jail for obstruction of justice. So, yeah, you might want to be careful of using uh, blanket statements like that in any form because, you know, you, know, you could be proven wrong at any damn time. I mean, you're not infallible, Chili. Put me in jail for six months. Judge Zimmerman. So now I'm dealing with the onslaught of having to keep my business alive, keep my social media channels going, and keep my attitude and my head up as I'm inside of an absolute horrific system that was initially built and intended to punish black people for being black. I think uh, Chile here is uh, pretty much hinting at post-Civil War Reconstruction era uh, politics right here. Uh but come on now, Chili. Uh, the uh, system has been just as harsh on uh, any other ethnicity, just as it has been on African Americans. Just ask Larry Lawton right here. Go to his YouTube channel and uh, look up how he was treated in the prison system and how he's advocating for a better way of doing things. I mean, uh, it's very insightful. So to put it bluntly, dude, uh, your suffering is not exactly unique to you, Chili. In fact, some people get it far worse, and not all of them are African American, you freaking douchebag. Now, I wish that wasn't true, but the actual process of this dungeon, if you get in trouble in here and they put you in the hole, they don't give you a book or a pencil. That means your brain cells shrink. An antisocial man who commits crimes is more likely to be more antisocial and commit more crimes if you shrink his brain cells. Why would they put you in a six by nine foot room and take away your pencil and your book if it wasn't to create you worse, to make you a worse person? And so that's what this system is based on. The entire penal system in America is based on punishing black people for being black. And there you go. Another blanket statement right there, Chili. Are you saying that the entire justice system is built in this manner? Or could it be that there might be a number of bad eggs in there that are just in there to, well, do this to the African-American population? I mean, uh, yeah, that's possible too right there, Chili. But you know what? Uh... I still say you need to stay away from the blanket statements because in the end, you uh, can be proven wrong with those kinds of statements. Now, I'm pretty conservative, so not everything is racist. However, the jail system and the prison system was literally created for exactly the reasons I stated. And I'm living it. I'm inside of it. I'm seeing it. I understand the processes in here now. It's completely barbaric. It, it's the most inhumane treatment you can possibly imagine. Now, fortunately for me, inside of the Clark County Detention Center, there are body cams on the supervising jail guards, and so they have body cams on. They follow a very rigid set of policies, procedures, and protocols in here. So this is one of the best-run dungeons in America. I, the cops have not, the, the guards in here have not beat on me, and they have not hurt me, and other than put me in the hole, which I think was unjust for live streaming a phone call, 
I live streamed a phone call. They literally came in with 12 men, put me in handcuffs, and took me down to this place, six by nine foot room. So I don't think it was fair, and I will petition this place when I get out for putting me in that hole. Oh, Chili, you didn't realize that jail is not supposed to be a paradise where your uh, uh, privileges get taken away from you because you acted like a bad boy out on the streets? I mean, come on now, dude. You're not supposed to be live streaming from there. You're supposed to be contemplating your uh, past and what you did wrong. Uh, but not in your case. See, you're just going to sit in there and whine, cry, and complain, and blame everybody else for your own damn problems that you created yourself. But as far as being May 10th, 2024, I'm 60 days away from the appeal brief. The appeal brief is online. It's been filed. I will call my attorneys, and I'll get it on my website, Legal Laws, within the next 24 hours. If you're not keeping up with my case, you should read that appeal brief. It goes over four basic factors that I have a First Amendment right. Number two is that the, the statute is arbitrary and capricious, very vague and ambiguous. Uh, it could mean anything. Number three, uh, judicial misconduct or judicial bias. And number four, ineffective counsel. Those are the four points that the that the appeal brief will cover. And so you can, I'm going to have it on deletelaws.com. Deletelaws.com with the Z. I'll have it up there in the next 24 hours. Well, at this point, he really starts to get into uh, thanking his subscribers for sending him care packages and everything like that. So we'll just go ahead and skip that part and go to the uh, point where I promised before where we will see a real lawyer tear apart the brief that Chili wrote up. And, uh, well, it is freaking hilarious how stupid Chili can really be. Well, I said there would not be a chilly video for a while, but now I got a copy of the brief that he filed or his lawyer filed. I want you to see this brief. Now, I'm not saying there's malpractice. I'm not saying he did a bad job. So please, I'm just getting that out there. I also want to show you the rules uh, for appellate procedure in Nevada. And again, I'm a California lawyer, not a Nevada lawyer. So I'm not giving Nevada legal advice, just my perception as a lawyer that handles appeals and uh, First Amendment issues. By the way, uh, one of the comments in uh, my video yesterday was, he's not a First Amendment lawyer. Yeah, defamation is First Amendment. So please understand that. When you defame somebody, you're making speech. And when you make speech, it is First Amendment. <laughs> okay, whatever. Yeah, Patrick, that sounded to me like uh, one of the many uh, frauditor lens lickers out there. You know, they call us bootlickers, so we end up calling uh, them lens lickers and everything like that. I mean, tit for tat, uh, they call us one thing, we call them something else. We like to think that we've all grown up and left the childish names on the playground, but no, uh, apparently not. So let's take a look at this. This is the rule for criminal procedure uh, appeals. The 3C is the fast track rule. Now, here are some of the rules that are required when you do a fast track appeal. It's limited to 16 pages in length. Wow. Well, what I saw was 31 pages. It also has a look like it does here in California. It has a limit on word count because this is the way to prevent people from filing 31 page briefs. It looks to me that this is a non-compliant brief. Now, pay attention, Chili. This is something very basic you should know. I mean, in many cases, especially with uh, scholarly articles and everything like that, there is a limit to what you can write as far as word count, page count, and everything like that. Case in point, if you'd ever been to a uh, college or university, you'd realize that you get these limits on what you can write as far as word count, uh, page count, and everything like that. Simply, simply because nobody wants to sit around and read a thousand-page essay on something that, uh, well, nobody wants to read anyway. Though in a research course at one point, I ended up having to write a 41-page uh a uh, research paper and it had well over 13,000 words in it. So, yeah, there's that occasional one. For several reasons. For example, how does this court have jurisdiction? Because if they don't have jurisdiction, they can't render a decision. 
And so you would say the court has jurisdiction under Nevada rule such and such because this is an appeal of a criminal conviction in the justice court. Bang. One sentence. The statement of the case and procedural history. So they want a concise review of what happened in the case. And then a concise statement summarizing all facts material to consideration of the issues on appeal. You better not miss something. So here I noticed that the appellate brief was 31 pages. I calculated the filing deadline and it was right. This is missing. I didn't see that specifically as a heading with that question answered. An outline of the alleged errors of the district court, or in this case, it would be the justice court because you're appealing to the district court. I didn't see that. And then a statement describing how the alleged issues on appeal were preserved during trial. This is the invited error or waiver that we see here in California, which obviously I think is going to apply in Nevada as well. You know, if you don't object to something, then it's usually waived. There are, of course, always limited exceptions to the failure to object. But the bottom line is, is that when you see a judge sitting on the bench, the judge is an umpire, umpire. But in baseball, the umpire calls balls and strikes automatically. In a trial, that's not how it happens. The umpire only makes a decision when you ask the umpire to make a decision. I took his brief and then I converted it into Word so I could type on it and then converted it back to uh, PDF. So, of course, it doesn't really look like this. These of communicating that are effective and ineffective. And you can't always avoid these. You just don't want to rely on them too much. Uh, passive voice usually puts people to sleep. It starts to sound robotic. And robots do not persuade. Was, had, have, would. Those words, those words... You know, sometimes you just can't avoid using them. They're the most direct way to say something, but you tend to want to avoid using them too much. The verb was, was cited, see, I used it 84 times, had, have, would. And then I noticed there's a curious sentence structure that keeps repeating itself. And the more that the sentence structure resume, resumes a cadence, the less persuasive it becomes. Glick, but it's not from this circuit, which I find puzzling. You want Ninth Circuit authority, not First Circuit. Clearly is a word that you want to avoid using, except in very obvious situations, because clearly is telling the judge or the justice how to think. More persuasive arguments include suggestions about what the outcome should be. And some of this uh, didn't come out too well because it got converted over on top of converted, but I don't like capitalize words in the middle of sentences because it starts to look like a ransom note a la Dirty Harry. You don't want to use entirely capitalized words in academic papers either because it makes it look like you're shouting at the reader. I mean, that's something you don't want to do because the reader may lose interest. And if your reader is the teacher who's grading you, then, uh, well, you might just get points off for that BS. But this isn't an academic paper. This is a legal paper that has real-world consequences that, uh, well, Chile is about to experience considering how much he failed here. And uh, procedural history was required. If you, re This is what I just briefly wrote in a matter of minutes. But this brief has a wind-up. I don't like wind-ups. You know, if you ask somebody what happened and they start from the beginning, and by the time they get to the end, you're kind of wondering what it was they were talking about appellant Jose de Castro was charged with two and he likes to do this. He puts the number right after the, the in, in parentheses, he'll do that repeatedly. You don't need to do that. And it says obstructing a public law. These things would be in quotations while filming a traffic stop. It says, Mr. De Castro appeared for an arraignment trial began. Judgment was entered the same day. And then again, this is the same day. So I don't know why he has to repeat the date. 180. Again, the number in parentheses, Following sentencing on March 19, he filed a timely notice of appeal without really saying the actual date of filing the appeal. So I just decided, rather than this long warm-up, I want to give somebody an overview. If you've got a 31-page brief, tell them what they're about to look at. Now, this is just very minimal. I would have added more to this, including what are the major issues on appeal, which is required under the appellate rules. So again, this is just a first draft for me. Jose de Castro, appellant or de Castro, was convicted on March 19 of two misdemeanors in the sections before Honorable Judge E. Zimmerman in Department 8 of the Clark County Justice Course. 
appellant, a prolific YouTuber who films police officers in search of potential human rights violations, was tried without a jury. Judge Zimmerman, who sought input from the district attorney regarding sentencing, ignored the people's suggestion of suspended 90-day jail sentence and instead sentenced the appellant to consecutive terms of 90 days each. Both Judge Zimmerman and Judge Michelle Levitt denied appellant's motions for release on bail pending the outcome of the appeal. In appealing the convictions, jurisdiction arises under Rules 3CA of the Nevada Rules of Appellate Procedure. The rules, lawyers like using defined terms. The appellant brings this fast-track appeal under Rule 3CE. A notice of appeal was filed on March 26, and the opening brief was timely filed on May 6, pursuant to Rule 26. The trial lasted less than a few hours. Only the appellant and police officer Brandon Bork testified, aside from live testimony. The lone exhibit admitted to evidence consisted of a truncated videotape of body cam footage lasting approximately 12 minutes. Now, you can add to that, obviously, but... Wouldn't you really know what's going on if you're the judge, justice, looking at this? Oh, okay. Okay, got it. Now your brain is starting to wrap around what is about to happen. Then I would follow with the statement of issues on appeal. So here's this, the historic stuff on this. Uh, he's been employed with approximately eight, eight years. So what? At approximately conducted a vehicle stop on a Hyundai. Vehicle was pulled over in a Target. I like how Target is not capitalized. Officer Bork was dressed in his uniform and was driving a clearly marked black and white Las Vegas Metropolitan Volume Official Vehicle. How about just saying Officer Bork was in a squad car when he approached De Castro? Now, you don't have to say was, but you get the idea. Look how many words you just saved. Then he writes this. The sole occupant of the vehicle was a female who was cooperative and provided a picture of her license on her phone. Well, he just transitioned from this to this. So is he saying that Officer Bork was a, was a female? Oh, Tilly just really made a huge mistake in basic writing right there. You've got to clarify your statements and uh, use proper transitions when you write, you dumbass. Otherwise, the reader will get confused as to what is actually going on here. And in this case, you ended up uh, making uh, all the officer look like a female when he was actually a male. I mean, good freaking grief, dude. Officer Bork was dressed in his uniform and was driving. Now it switches to a female from his, but says the sole occupant of the vehicle <laughs> was a female. This really belongs up here. He's talking about the vehicle that was pulled over. That's kind of funny if you ask me. During the vehicle stop, Mr. DeCastro, a member of the press. Now, you know, this again, they love to, they love to emphasize this press thing. Okay, fine. He owns a YouTube channel. I don't think he owns it, because I don't think you own anything on YouTube, but you might have a license to use it. Police activities, because he believes police misconduct is an epidemic in the country. Right. Then you'll see that a lot of this stuff begins with his name or the other person's name, and it becomes more of a cadence, you know, the number followed by the number in parentheses. However, I call these sentence interrupters. <laughs> uh, there's also, I think, lack of punctuation here. Normally, there would be a colon, and then it would explain it. Unfortunately, trial counsel, now, I think it pained uh, Orem to mention Michael Mee by name. In fact, he doesn't mention him by name at all. And then uses a footnote to say, I'm not trial counsel. And it gets even more hilarious because if you look at the notice of appeal that was filed, Michael Mee's name is on it. So I think they have something to answer for. He admitted that Mr. Castro backed up, but he did not substantially back up. However, he also said he did not back up. The video demonstrates that the officer is clearly wrong. See, this is a conclusion that needs to be elaborated more. And it's, this is a false statement, I think. Uh, DeCastro asked the driver if he was okay. He did say that and did not make any further comments. But he did. He mentioned, I, I remember seeing that he talked to her twice. Well, Patrick, you got to remember that this is Chili's narrative right here. And uh, what he says in his little world goes in his little world. But, you know, Chili is... Not exactly of this world right here, so the two worlds don't end up meshing very well. And in this particular occasion, uh, I feel like the real world is the one that's going to win out over his fictional one. He, to back up on several occasions, we never stayed out far, that's true. Claiming he had no opportunity because that's true. Obviously, see, you, you want to avoid these obviously, clearly... The officer admitted he observed two, no weapons on Mr. DeCastro, holding two, two cell phones. He says, go get in your car, little doggy. But he leaves out the part, I think DeCastro said something like, 
why don't you write your effing ticket? Go back in your car and write your effing ticket. That's significant. If I was the people, I would play up on that and say, wait a minute, you know, why are you leaving that part out? You don't want to make him look too vile. There's also repetitive error here in the quotation and the period. I don't normally, I don't do that. You usually see uh, two space separation between the periods. Having decided to let the motorist go, instead concentrate below. Why would you say that the officer had an irrational fear when he said on the stand and he wasn't afraid of anything? In fact, he said that DeCastro wasn't a threat. Why would you put that in there? Doesn't that kind of contradict what the cop said? His testimony concerning officer's safety belied. The, you don't want to use words like belied. Try to keep the words simple. Then it says, the officer is clearly agitated and frustrated and does not appear fearful in any manner. Yeah, he's aggressive, as depicted in the video. And again, these pronoun references are problematic. I mean, you can figure it out, but it's not really clear writing because you're mentioning De Castro and the cop, and then you say he. Yeah, this goes right into Chile's uh, so-called uh, scholarly authorship. I mean, come on now, Chile. Don't you realize you still have to clarify what you're saying here? I mean, you've got two he's. Which one are you talking about? Are you talking about the officer or are you, or are you talking about yourself? That is where you need to clarify it by saying either the officer or De Castro. You don't use the word he unless you absolutely ne need it. I mean, this is... English 1101 kind of BS right here. And for clarification's sake, uh, English 1101 or ENC 1101 is the entry-level course in colleges that uh, pretty much teaches you how to write uh, argument and persuasion, academic papers, and everything like that. And the next level up is ENC 1102, and then you go on to other college writing courses after that that are a lot more advanced. So basically, Chile right here would probably be relegated to a remedial uh, writing a course at a college before he would even qualify to be an English 1101, at least in the state of Florida. I mean, given from what uh, the lawyer has talked about right here. So in other words, Chile wouldn't even qualify as, uh, well, college level material when it comes to writing anything at all. How about just cutting this down? You could say something like, the officer testified at trial he was not fearful of De Castro. The officer testified to technique utilized in the police academy where an attacker can reach a police officer within 21 feet under certain circumstances. That's right, the 21 foot rule. Now, I also know of a 21 foot rule. If you had 21, I can't help myself, foot long subways, you've got the 21 foot rule. There's the therefore again. The officer concluded that he has some type of imaginary legal rule. See, that kind of language does not fit very well in appellate briefs because. It's sarcastic. Hell, that wouldn't even hold up in a basic academic paper at any college. You don't say, this is imaginary. I mean, come on now, Chili. Aren't you supposed to be a legal scholar? Shouldn't you know this basic bullshit? This was presented as a valid piece of evidence by the state without regard to any legal authority. Well, it got admitted into evidence, so you need to talk about that. Arbitrary and capricious is an unconstitutionality standard. Be careful when you say that. You better really know what you're talking about. Additionally, officer seems confused as motives for the arrest. If you're saying it seems confused, then you're not saying, saying anything with authority, which means the tie goes to the runner, as can be easily depicted. And then there's easily again. And now he goes into George Floyd, which is from a different district, and now... I get the perception, this is just me, I don't have any proof of this. This sounds like something Chile wanted Orem to put into the brief. I think it's I think it's completely out of bounds. First of all, wrong district. Secondly, nobody died. And in fact, the whole premise of what Chile was saying at trial was what's the big deal? You know, I I <laughs> What did I really do other than piss off a cop and try to film? That's what he's saying. But now he's trying to compare it to some civil rights abuse where someone died. 
So you, you got to be careful not to cloud the record with stuff that makes the judges wonder, wait a minute, what am I missing here? Why are we even talking about this? Would the state of Nevada prefer that the state of Minnesota and the federal government prosecute the filmers of George Floyd of the George Floyd and perhaps suppress the evidence? This would be what we call a rhetorical question. I have never seen the state of Nevada ever question the state of Minnesota, and I've never seen the federal authorities also be joined in questioning by the state of Nevada. And this really doesn't, this is a bad analogy. Okay, maybe, I don't know. I, I feel like this was Chile's part in this brief. Yeah, I would say that it would be Chile that has done this. I mean, it's got all his characteristic uh, BS analysis and uh, everything like that. I mean, there's no getting around it. This is definitely Chile. You know, the federal government of the state had any ridiculous notion. See, again, this is inflammatory language, and it doesn't usually work very well in appeals. Additionally, so... So, kind of sounds kind of too informal for an appellate brief, did not capture police brutality against the motorist, he must be guilty. Although in federal court, Mr. DeCastro will be able to bring a federal lawsuit against the officer for his brutal treatment when Officer Bork grabbed Mr. DeCastro during the unlawful arrest and violation of the first, fourth, and 14 minutes. I can't even say this without running out of breath. You need to break the sentences down. They need to be clear. And this just sounds like an argumentative statement that is, again, not something I would put in an appellate brief. We have another sentence interrupter. Alternatively, if he had captured police brutality towards the motorist and was covered all over the mainstream press, Mr. Castro would be named a hero. I think you'd probably put that in quotes. It would not have been found guilty of the allegations. I don't know that that's true because, remember, you're trying to overcome the standard of proof, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. The highest standard we have, even higher than clear and convincing evidence, this is not doing this. It never seemed to occur to defense counsel, the prosecutor, nor the trial court. When you start taking pot shots at a trial judge, be careful. Because the general rule would be is that when you're chopping up a judge and showing this disrespect, the appellate courts could say they could recoil on that. And they would say, you must not have any other real arguments here. If all you want to do, if one of the things you want to do is basically besmirch the reputation of the judge. Yeah, that's pretty much the ad hominem fallacy in a nutshell. Attack the uh, person making the argument rather than the argument itself, uh, which is a common tactic among frauditors. Attack the person, not the argument. You have to take it in a very tactful and respectful way. And if you say it never seemed to occur, and I don't like starting with indefinite pronouns, it never seemed to occur, would have caused prosecution of the bystanders filming during the murder of Mr. Floyd. I can tell you for a fact that I don't think that that ever came up as something that anyone was even thinking about because the, the, the parallel is ridiculous, to use the word that he used in the brief. So we have another it and another it, and it seemed to go over everyone's head. That is, that, that's going to be underlined by a, a justice or a judge that's reading this appellate brief. It's going to be underlined. Here we get to additionally, a question of concern must be addressed. Well, why wouldn't you address it? Why would you need to label it that way? If Mr. DeCastro was an African-American and the driver of the vehicle was an African-American female, would the state have prosecuted this case? Oh, okay, so now... We're going to take this from this simple traffic stop to now turning it into a parallel to a murder case and racism. Last I checked, um, nothing discussed about racism in the trial. So now you're not citing to anything that's in the record of the trial. Well, Chile did say he was not racist, so which basically makes you think, uh, well, maybe Chile is racist if he's bringing that up. I mean, so it only makes sense that uh, this kind of thing would be in this brief if he said he was not racist when he truly is racist. He's just trying to hide the fact that he is racist to try to throw everybody off. I mean, yeah, sounds like a typical tactic by Chile right there. And the, the rules generally prohibit that. 
You want it to be clear and focused. Hey, the statutes say this. It's so unfocused. And I, I think that Chile is behind this. I don't think that Oren would have put this stuff in there. De Castro's evictions must be reversed based on violations of the first. Okay, we're finally at page 10 getting to it. The issue before this court is whether De Castro had a constitutional right pursuant to, to film. Of course he has that right. That's not really framing the question. While the police officer is conducting a minor trap, of course they do. You could film the cops. No one said you couldn't. The cop admitted that. So why are you saying that's the issue? Even the judge said that's not the issue. To affirm these convictions, this court would have to determine Mr. Castro, a member of the press, member of the public. Does Well, when is the press not a member of the public? Does not have the right to film a police officer conducting his ordinary daily duties. This statement makes no sense to me. This legal rationale would violate clearly and historically established. Of course, there's no citations to the cases that say this. This is just argument. Remember, argument is not evidence. The court has provided important dicta. Dicta means that that's not what the case was about. I I can't remember even citing the one law review article. Because most law review articles, you know, it's like so what? And right now you need to pers persuade her that beyond a reasonable doubt, this conviction needs to be overturned or there's such a serious error that it affected the outcome. That's where her mind is right now. And in fact, in fact, and nope, you could eliminate these words. At no point in the trial or pre-trial proceedings, you could just say at no time during the history of this case was a single legal authority cited regarding the most fundamental rights guaranteed to the public and the precedent of the First Amendment. Great. I'm glad you just said that. Now, did, is this invited error? Hmm. Now, here we go to Glick, a case that is in the First Circuit, not the Ninth Circuit. That's a big problem because... You need to find the cases that are within our district, not somewhere else, unless there are no cases in our district. And then they cited Glick forever and ever, and they went into a lot of trouble to cite to Glick. And again, these would normally be quotation marks. This part's a little bit hilarious here. This is the internal pagination reference to the case itself, because you need to take that part out. They're actually referring to both counts, so it would be counts one and two. These are all conclusory statements. I would have expected a much more in-depth analysis. Once again, no Nevada authority. This is going to be a tough argument. You notice nowhere in here he's referring to, uh, to Castro as a constitutional law scholar. He said that on the stand. Now, I've been saying that once you decide to give yourself that name, you have opened the door to a heightened level of awareness and knowledge of the laws. So interestingly, they have decided to do away with the constitutional law scholar designation because I think they realize that it's a problem for him. The formatting of this whole damn legal brief right here is a problem for him at the very least. I mean, it looks like it was written by somebody who uh, has no experience in writing at all. I mean, I don't blame Chile's lawyer at this point. I say, like I've said before, that this was entirely written by Chile himself, or at the very least, some uh, second grader who uh, just decided to uh, scribble things out on a uh, notepad or something like that. Vague and ambiguous. It is obvious that there is no 21-foot rule, again, with the quotations in the period. Obviously, many there's more obviously walk within 21 feet of the police in their vehicle. But I think this is misstating what the cop said. He didn't say it's always 21 feet. Yeah, he never attempted to physically interfere, but under the Wilson decision, you don't have to physically interfere to be busted for obstruction. By the state and federal constitutional rights when his trial was presided over by a judge with prejudice against, this is really, I really, I, no way. I, you know, this this to me is is just not the right approach. You. I rarely see appellate briefs that tear into a judge like this. You could say that the judge got it wrong uh, in a very diplomatic way. You could say the court failed to apply this reasoning. You don't mention the judge by name. You say the court, the, um, the factors the court weighed should have included this. You know, people are fine with that. But now you're saying that the judge was prejudiced. Well, you never argued that she was prejudiced prejudicial towards you during the trial. You didn't argue that during the pretrial hearings. You didn't move to disqualify the judge. It's called a 170.6 out here in California. So now 
what you wait till you get the verdict the decision you don't like and now you claim it yeah patrick that's pretty much how it is the little chili boy here got his feel feels hurt when he didn't get the uh, verdict he desired and now uh he wants to uh be all butt hurt and take it out on the judge and everything like that so basically yeah uh it's a lot of hurt feelings right here coming out of a the childish little man. And you know, to add to that, I do believe that the fact that the judge was a woman really ended up hurting Chili even more. The fact that a woman decided Chili's fate in this particular case. Yeah, that really had to uh, hurt Chili at that point. And you know what? Chili, get over it. I like the extra period here. That helps emphasize that you need to stop your thought again. The trial court then orders Mr. DeCastro to empty all his pockets. Walk right into a courtroom. You have already surrendered those rights. It says here that the trial court noted your reference to her marshal as a pig. She did, but Zimmerman did not say that was the reason for the sentence. It was the videotape. Remember, Oren was at the bail motion hearing where she said that. So this is a little bit misleading, if you ask me. It's not really that accurate. The legal standard actual bias, unless it's got copied wrong when I converted it, that once again, it's a non-complete sentence. She didn't have any stake in the outcome or become embroiled in the battle. Well, if you're going to say she's embroiled in the battle, actually, she did not cite him in contempt and gave him mid-range sentences. The trial court should have disqualified herself based upon implied bias. I don't think that that's bias at all. If you want to mouth off to a judge, if I did, I would be facing the same predicament. So now you're getting into the situation that I really don't like as well. Now you've got Michael Mee and now you're throwing him under the bus. The problem is, is that I don't know the reasons for it. This isn't the guy's first rodeo and he's got a lot of significant wins. Let me just say this. If I had a client, and I've had them, who dictates to me how I'm supposed to do my job, I'm going to make mistakes. If you're overbearing, you're now making me think I've got to run things past you, and stuff is moving fast. While he's talking about an exhibit, and I'm thinking about what rule could exclude that exhibit, you're in my ear complaining about the fact that he's a liar. Very difficult. I saw Michael Mee's body language. He was uncomfortable. His arms were crossed. He just, it, you know... You're going to say these things. I had a client that did that to me in one of my cases. You're going to bring all this stuff up. And he got mad at me because I didn't want to. It had no relevance. And I was scoring points with the judge. Once I brought it up, the judge said to me, where are you going with this, counsel? The only thing that was evidence that I saw was the videotape. And I mentioned that the videotape had come in just from the sheer testimony of the parties identifying what was happening. This is, I think, a, a real stretch. What he's saying here is that had... Michael Mee submitted this briefing to the judge before the trial or at a separate hearing or had a separate motion for it, it would have been sufficient to blow out these two claims, almost like summary judgment in a civil case. That's not really true in my book because I'm reading what you're writing here in this appellate brief, and I haven't been persuaded that you've, that you've moved the needle much at all here. I, I don't think this brief is winning. I write it, I, I kind of selected it in red when I copied it over. Unconstitutionally vague and ambiguous. They have the burden here, and I'm not I'm not seeing it, you know, not as it's been presented here. Yeah, I really don't see it there either, Patrick. I mean but this is chili we're talking about right here. Uh he brings up all sorts of uh, wild ass claims right out of his damn ass. And, uh, well, uh, given how he wrote this up, I would say he has the uh, writing skills of, of an academically challenged eighth grade writer. So basically no talent for it whatsoever as far as his writing skill goes. I mean, he goes into all sorts of uh, logical fallacies like he always does and uh, really makes himself look like a complete and total jackass. Uh, so, yeah, typical chili. Uh, so, 
Yeah, this is not going to work out for him. Yeah, Tilly, you're not going to be out in July. You're going to be laughed out of court. And that is the fact of the matter. And, uh, yeah, so good luck with that. So at any rate, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next one. Dude, so there's no way I can get in, bro? Come on, I'll put you on my YouTube. But shut up, Wesley. You gotta put signs up, ma'am, if it's- Are you Glenn Serio? Who's that?